he saved him from the flood. God remembered Abraham, and he spared his nephew Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah. God remembered Rachel, and she was able to have a child. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, and they delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. Remember me. The thief on the cross next to Jesus said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. The thief was saying, Deliver me from the prison that I am destined for. Help me to have some inkling of value as I die here with you. you know, I credit much of my faith to the church that I grew up in. The youth group, the Sunday school teachers, the adults who cared, they changed my life for the better. I felt loved at my church growing up, and because of that, there was nowhere else that I would rather be. When I went to college, I became a youth intern at another church in the area, and the youth minister there <laughs> encouraged me and another intern to dress up on Sunday mornings in funny hats and goofy outfits. That's part of where that came from. <laughs> we brought a big smile to everyone's faces and it encouraged the youth to return for Sunday night for our youth group activities. My friend, the other intern, and I, we would go to the college Sunday school class at my home church where I grew up, and then we would drive to the other church where we volunteered for worship and the youth activities. We would wear our funny hats and our goofy outfits to both churches. The church where we were youth interns was much smaller and laid back. The church I grew up in was much larger, and you might say that they had more uh, rules than the other church. My home church, they didn't care much for the funny hats and the goofy outfits that we wore. They said that we were a disruption to the youth activities there, even when we just said hi to the youth and brought a smile to their faces before we went to the college Sunday school class. The church that raised me asked me and my friend to never have any interaction with the youth at our church anymore. I had a meeting with one of the pastors who told me, Russell, the goofy hats that y'all are wearing might be great for that other church. They're definitely funny, but they belong at that church. They're not appropriate here. We would rather you just go to the college Sunday school class and not even walk by the youth building here anymore. In fact, we don't want any college students interacting with youth anymore. I mean, why would you want to anyway? You're in college. I was really upset when my friends from college came home over the holidays and no one said a word to them for interacting with the youth. But sadly, my story is not the only story like this I've heard. So many college students leave the church simply because they are told that they're a disruption to the youth. And I guarantee they're not wearing goofy hats like me either. In my personal conversations with people who no longer attend church, generally one of the two reasons come up. Either they feel judged by other people in the church, or they just judge themselves. They don't feel like God would welcome them back in a church. You know, someone, somewhere, said that the way that they act, the way they dress, or the way their friends act and dress is inappropriate. You know, maybe another church will accept you, but your behavior is just not appropriate here. Or maybe we're our own worst critic. We don't believe paradise is possible for us anymore. I mean, you know that sick feeling that you get when you feel like you're no longer welcome at your own home? The thief on the cross felt this way. Jesus was in the middle of two thieves on the cross. One thief joined the rest of the crowd at spitting at Jesus and hurling insults at him. And the other thief, he participated in this for a while too. Until he heard Jesus pray. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Then this thief, he stopped joining in the crowd and condemning this man. And he said to the other thief, you don't understand. This man did nothing wrong. He didn't deserve to die like us. We are getting what we deserve, but this is not justice for this man. I imagine the thief thought to himself, my life is hopeless right now. I'm going to die in a matter of hours, humiliated and defeated. But maybe, just maybe, Jesus might be my hope. Maybe, just maybe. Jesus might be my hope. Maybe there really is a God who loves us. Maybe there is a God who cares for the hopeless. Maybe there is a God who gives second chances. Then he made the most simple but profound prayer that one can make. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
Help me and deliver me. And Jesus replies, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The thief knows that he doesn't deserve deliverance. He doesn't deserve grace. He doesn't deserve to be welcomed home. He would gladly accept the fact that paradise is no longer for him. But Jesus says it is. Today, paradise for a thief. Like the prodigal son who wastes away his inheritance, a party is waiting for him. Like Jesus defended the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the worst sinners of them all, Jesus is prepared to stay and eat dinner with them. Grace is available. There is still hope. Paradise is possible. Like Jesus lived, he died. See, the seven sayings that Jesus makes on the cross speaks to the heart of Jesus' ministry throughout his entire life. Today you will be with me in paradise is a statement of God's grace that Jesus had been making throughout his life, both by his stories, his parables, and his actions. Paradise is yours. The kingdom is here today for you. Now, there were once these robbers who broke into a department store one night, but they didn't steal anything. What they did is they changed the price tags on everything in the department store. They exchanged the price of a $400 camera with a $6 piece of stationery. And what was once priceless was now worthless. What once was valuable was now cheap. What was worthless now meant something. The store opened the next day as usual, and people made purchases as normal for four hours without noticing the different price tags. Four hours, and no one noticed. You know, we're often told what is valuable in our society when it's really just a waste of time and money. You know, people will pay millions to hear celebrity gossip or government secrets, but will ignore the children without a home or without the right education. People hold value to wearing the right clothes, but will shun someone for looking different than the accepted norm. But like Zacchaeus in the Bible, the short, crooked tax collector who hides in a tree to not be seen by Jesus or the crowd of people who absolutely despise him, Jesus walks right up to him. And Jesus asks to be welcomed in Zacchaeus' home. Jesus invites a scene of misfits, prostitutes, tax collectors, and thieves to eat dinner with him. You know, I picture Jesus just laughing and sharing stories about God's kingdom with such transparency that he only had with a group like this. You know, and I also picture the religious people pointing and waving their fingers at Jesus saying, why do you eat with people like that? You know, today we Christians, we're good at making decisions for God and the church. You can't do that. You can't eat with them. You can't wear that to church. These people are not acting appropriately. Like I was kicked out of my own church for wearing a goofy outfit, many people have tried to tell me that some of you are not welcome because you're too rebellious, or you don't act appropriately, or you're divorced, or you're not married, or you're not here on time, or you take up too much time. That's when Jesus said to these religious punks, you just don't understand, do you? As Jesus said in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. You haven't put value on them. You've kicked them out of your churches and synagogues. You've kicked them out of your home. But today, they're in paradise. Today, these rebels and these misfits have a home. They are welcome here. At this church, we're about grace, and we mean it. We love you where you are. Jesus says, I'm changing the value system that you hold so dear. They are my beloved. These thieves and misfits are the honored guests in my kingdom. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Today. You know, I've often heard Florida called um, heaven's waiting room. Heaven's waiting room. We're close to heaven here. You know, the joke is that every, everyone retires here, but I think we're pretty close to paradise here. Maybe we even experience heaven here and now, today. As Jesus said to his disciples, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, the outcast of the religious society, the time is coming. In fact, it has already come when it won't matter where you worship or how you worship. What matters is that you worship from your
their true selves in true adoration, in spirit, and in truth. Worship is here for you today. We, the thieves, are in paradise today. You know, this makes people uncomfortable because they're not sure if they're ready for people like us. You know, but God says that there is a failure to excommunicate. Jesus loves the sinners who the world just loves to hate. Paradise was lost, but paradise is back, baby, today. The Greek word for paradise here actually comes from a Persian word used in ancient times to refer to the king's garden. The king's garden was this walled garden that was a place of profound beauty. It included beautiful gardens and trees and water features. When someone was honored in ancient Persia, they were given the privilege of enjoying the king's garden. And there is much Im imagery of gardens throughout the Bible. The Garden of Eden was the original garden of paradise enjoyed by the first humans, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden because they disobeyed God. Human beings have been forbidden from entering the garden ever again. Paradise was lost to humankind. But the Gospel of John tells us that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane for the courage to do the will of God. And then Jesus was crucified in the garden at Calvary, and then buried in the garden next to Calvary. And the Gospel of John tells us that Mary Magdalene saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead, but she thought he was, what, a gardener. I think this is the way of saying, hit, hit, do you see what Jesus did here? He reclaimed the Garden of Eden. Paradise is back for humanity. Jesus was the gardener that welcomed us back to be with him in paradise. Jesus opened the door to the king's garden once and for all. Through Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, Jesus was removing the curse that banished humankind from the garden, from paradise, and he invites us to return to paradise with him. And the first person that he invited to join him in paradise was a hardened criminal, a thief on the cross. Today, you will be with me in paradise. See, the heart of Jesus' words on the cross are that we can be in paradise too. No matter what we've done, grace is for us. Paradise is our home. This is the message of the cross. We're reconciled back to heaven, to paradise. We're forgiven of our transgressions, and Jesus changed your price tag. You're not only valuable, you're the king's honored guest. And our message to our guests, our new church members today, our current members, and those who think they're not appropriate enough for church, well, you're not appropriate. But we're not either. So welcome home to the house of the misfits, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, and thieves, today, we will be with Jesus in paradise. Paradise starts for all of us.